and welcome to another episode of Thoughts on Talks, where Reverend Mike is doing his best photogenic still <laughs> smile, and Salam Thompson has joined us again for our continuing conversations, learning about Black Americans and their experience, and all the things that we who are not Black Americans maybe didn't know. I, and I thought we were going to talk about the playoffs. <laughs> well, I'm make sure a little room for that. that. <laughs> there was a lot You're going on with that. On yes, <laughs> there was a lot going on there. So if you see me uh, thumb wrestling away, you know, last night we just couldn't believe what we saw. So <laughs> I didn't see anything because no. I I ignore all sports equally. Uh, Cricket, rugby, American football, World Cup, soccer doesn't matter to me. I ignore it all. Equal opportunity and biblets, huh? That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> Watching so, it will do what's that. on your hat today? Uh, this is a logo of uh, the Chicago Blackhawks. One of them, they have um, the C with the um, little axis for lack of a better term. But mm -hmm. the only reason I turned it around is because the I didn't want the misperception of its actual logo uh, the Blackfoot, you know, Indian, you know, on the, the front. So just uh, for propriety's sake, that's why mm -hmm. I turned it behind. So, but that's I'm the, still a Chicago Blackhawks fan, but at the same time, given the sensitivity around where we are uh, today, yeah. um, at least the name is, isn't derogatory like the Washington Redskins were right. before they stripped that name. So mm -hmm. it actually has a historic root um to uh, geographic tribe. location yeah. In, yeah. in chicago and in and around uh the illinois region you know mm -hmm. so but just you know to save you know folks any uh, the explanation with that i just thought that for this conversation it'd be uh quite um counterproductive to have that blazing yeah. on the front so well i like I how it uh, color coordinates with your bismillah t-shirt oh, uh, that i am i am a color coordinated um, <laughs> aficionado, if you will. So like I have, uh, if you notice, I have uh, different beads. All of the beads I have have uh, the 99 attributes of Allah all over them. Oh, wow. You know, on, on each one. So uh, on, on one side of the bead, it has Allah. On the other side, it has that particular attribute that's in play. And Salam, wow. my name is uh, the fifth attribute of Allah. So um, going in, and I guess, if you will, they're equivalent to uh, Joppa beads that, um, you know, um, well, folks in, you know, the ashrams or in meditation, you know, right. that they use. And they're, you know, throughout the meditation, they're uh, touching and honing and focusing in on that particular point, mm -hmm. if you will, as they go make their way around. So, yeah. Is it used like rosary beads are used? Absolutely, absolutely. This is the exact same concept, the exact same concept. It's just, um, you know, I a have a dual purpose for it, uh, you know, during uh, the what we call the night of power, which is uh, the 27th night of Ramadan. Uh, mm. So I usually have them in my hand while the, the prayer is being um, underway. And I, but mm. I guess it's a vigil, a vigil for mm -hmm. a lack of a better term, but it goes into the night, like well past midnight, it's almost one in the morning when it's over. So, um, so I have like um, different color schemes of the beads and depend on what outfit I have on, I just go through and pick which one. Ah, this navy blue looks good. So I that's a way that to do it. <laughs> Spirit and fashion working in concert. It, it blends, it, it blends and together. What does so. uh, Bismillah mean? It means it in the name of Allah. And so when the Imam starts off um, his prayer, he, he may start by saying, Audi Bilal Mina Shatani Rajim, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. And what that means is, you know, I seek refuge in Allah, uh, the Lord of the Dawn, in the name of Allah, the most beneficent and most merciful. And, and that's the common uh, prayer that's begun in the masjid and in solitude at home or even on the streets for that matter, um, mm -hmm. is the first surah of the Quran, which is al-Fataha, which means uh, the opening or the key. And I wish I had my set of keys handy there, over there by explaining. But 
if you had a um, a set of keys or you've seen a janitor with a, a bunch of keys rattling. Now we know that a key is mad as main and solitary function is to unlock a door, mm -hmm. right? Or unlock a safe or what have you, something that's securing something. You know, mm -hmm. but you have all those keys have the same function, but all of those keys can't unlock that particular lock or that particular door. So right. by the opening of the Quran, you, you know, Al Fatiha, you're unlocking unlocking and you're opening uh your the submitters, the Muslim, in communication with Allah in conjunction with your Muslimas that's right behind you. So okay. in, in frustration. That's uh, one of the things I really appreciate about having these conversations with you is that we not only get to learn about the black experience, but the black Muslim experience, yes. which um, yeah, I didn't realize that you actually read and spoke the Arabic words like mm -hmm. Muslims everywhere else in the world would. So um, that's, yes. that's just cool to learn. Maybe, and I see yes, that I you... Um, Sorry, I, I see that you no, have no Reverend Mike's book on your bookshelf now. Absolutely, absolutely. I got it in the mail. I was so excited. And uh, I read the back panel of all of the reviews. And being that, you know, I know this fella here, you know, for the past, of, what, five and a half years now, um, I kind of had a gist of what I would find in here, and I'm leaving the suspense there. I won't let him spoil it, but <laughs> given that he and I have had several uh, countless conversations in person, on the phone, uh, at Dodger games in between innings, you know, and um, we, I have a uh, understanding of where he's coming from uh, with this, and um, suffice it to say, it's a, a rarity that, you know, here you have a white Caucasian man who has origins in Ireland and uh, who has upbringing in America and by way of his skin, you know, can pass and be on the, I guess, spared side, you know, of Jim Crow uh, during the time which he's come up, even though he didn't grow up in the Jim Crow region. But if he were to visit there, he, he would pass. But considering that he has this um, equity, uh, this uh, enormous capital of skin privilege, that he would come forward and basically bear his soul saying, this is where I'm at. This is my journey. This is where I've been, you know, uh, like going through you know, his challenge, I won't spoil it for the re re viewers out there in case they haven't read it or don't, are not familiar with Reverend Mike's story, but i uh, let him speak to that too. But considering the, the, the winding turns that he's made and then what he has shared on Sunday, you know, in crediting Dr. Maureen Hoyt, you know, and as being one of the um, catalysts in that transition, you know, it's a, it's a remarkable reading that I'm greatly looking forward to. And I can, you can see the picture on the back there. Uh, I'll pull it up close so you can see uh, where's my lens. There you go. Right there. And so <laughs> you can see that's a fellow that knows how to sell water to a well. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love, you know. I'm watching the body language as you're saying this. And Reverend Mike is like, Shushing himself. <laughs> no, but I won't. Get, I won't give too too much information. But I'm really um I'm I'm thrilled to, that uh to have this book. I just need to get your signature, so we have to arrange that. You know, yeah. so I will, I'll leave the first page open for you. <laughs> there you go. And just, and it, and it's in good will, uh, just to let so yes, it does have many twists and turns, but nobody's sticking their head in the oven at the end. So fear not. True. <laughs> you ruined the ending, Reverend. Mike. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, but it's like the the levity that he brings to uh, to this type of uh, issues. I mean, yeah. like, well, you know, we anybody who's watched his talks, you know, at week in and week out, and when he's covering these things of this nature, as you will see in the subtitle, where it has something along the lines of recovering redneck, and um, they're just 
just, you know, just like we say in the, in the streets, like you just being 100 with it. You know, I mean, you just say, okay, this is where I, this is who I am. This is where I met. Uh, I see that's the destination. Okay. I don't quite know how to construct this road to get from where I met to that destination. But, you know, here's how I'm struggling with it. Here's how I've been successful with it. And that gives the readers a peek into, okay, I can see um, my idiosyncrasies in his journey and they can do the same thing. You know, so it's really, uh, the, the, it's not as thick as not a, a poor Richard's almanac by any means, you know, <laughs> but it's something that's rudimentary that can reach the, you know, the casual user that they right. can, a reader, I should say, and they can go forward and break ground on their own spirituality, as I mentioned in this review. Well, that was, that's, uh, that was the intent. So good. Well, I'll be interested in uh, comparing notes when you actually have time to go through it. Most certainly. Cool. So to, uh, this this week's Sunday talk was it's not set in cement. Concrete. Is that right? Concrete. Uh, cement. Yeah. I always get cement and concrete mixed up. They're different. Yeah. Struggle. Struggle is not set in concrete. Ah, mm -hmm. yes. yes. So uh, this was the opening chapter of the book. Okay. Right. And I just shared. But mixed in some other stuff. So our theme for the month is faith mm -hmm. and cultivating faith. So it's a, and which it's is a interesting. Uh, it's interesting considering you know here we are again. Where oh my goodness, you jumped off my shelf. What happened? <laughs> I wondered what that was. I thought <laughs> so it was a ghost. The book is exciting, you know. But uh, <laughs> it's um, one of those things where humanity outdoes itself again you know <laughs> uh, with we saw the events of this week i mean it seems as like the closer we get to election day and here we are just one day less than seven the seven week mark of election day in the united states and then you have um we over the past you know 90 to 120 days We've had the continuous, you know, exposure to uh, protests, to movements. You see the NFL taking center stage mm -hmm. and its various amount of protests and um, various methods, I should say. And, um, you know, the, now the singing, the lift every voice and sing, you know, before all the week one games. I'd like to see them continue it, but they didn't. I mean, you can, I mean, uh, it's like, I remember a wise person, um, uh, Alice Coltrane, so I mean, Sankitananda, she had said in one of her talks before, um, if you told five lies today, tell four tomorrow. And, and that's progress. And, and um, so this is what the NFL is doing. They're, they uh, omitted their one lie for the week. So we'll just let them, you know, figuratively go. But it's just so did they you think see, that? Instead of the national anthem or in addition to? In addition to, in okay. addition to, and never has that ever been done. I mean, we've seen um, ever since there've been, you know, sport teams in Canada, where they'll start off before seeing the national anthem, they'll sing, oh, Canada, you know, mm -hmm. God shed his grace on thee, you know, mm -hmm. then you proceed to say the national anthem. Well, you have this leagues like the NBA is 75, close to 80% black. And there's no anthem that speaks to them directly. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, where you have Stony the Road, we tried, Bitter the Chastening Rod, and that kind of thing. You know, but now, the, for the first time now, you have the NFL, you know, which is, I, I give them credit. Now, I won't go into uh, what I feel their motive is. I know they have some egg on their face, thanks to Mr. Colin Kaepernick for taking a stand that, that he, he took. But mm -hmm. now kneeling is, at this point, is, is, is like a fad. And you're kind of like, you know, um, it, it's, how can I say, you're almost like making light of the issue now, mm -hmm. you know, what kneeling is doing now. So now it's time to, you know, take that attention and, and shift it, you know, elsewhere. But now you have this, this situation um, down in Compton, you know, California. And, um, the, you know, depending on, you know, what's your favorite color, you may call it Bompton, but that's another story. But um, you have the 
the shooting of the two, you know, sheriffs, you know, down there. I've seen the video. And uh, what I've noticed um, is this didn't happen to me, but this happened to me before in other instances like this, where this, you'll see people just uh, blowing me up saying, well, well, Salam, what do you think about that? Are you going to denounce this or whatever? Well, what, ab well, what about what, uh, Oh, oh, oh here's the, the sheriffs are getting shot down or anything. I said, now you know me better than this that I'm not for the sheriffs getting shot. That's one thing. Number two, we're talking about a person, okay, that can walk up in broad daylight with a firearm in their hand and let off on two sheriffs, okay? So it's safe to assume that that person in all likelihood is not on the right side of the law. Okay, That said, why are we imploring that I protest a criminal? You see what I mean? And um, why is it that you know, we, I can't look at this situation and think, okay, let me ask the question. Do you think for any second that if given the description that they gave, 28 to 30 year old black man, that justice will not be served? You know, if, if justice is written the way it is, this person, considering how bad somebody wants $175,000, bad enough, is going to be captured, is going to be arraigned, is going to be indicted, going to be tried, you know, whether it be a jury of his own peers or not, is it may not be his own peers. They're going to throw the book at this person. They're going to convict him. They're going to sentence him and they're going to impr imprison him. That's like a cascading uh, effect of what happens when you commit a crime of various infractions from the most uh, minuscule to the most serious. In this case is more serious. You know, so given that that's how the system works, okay, within days, uh, they had the reward. Within days, we heard the um, the sheriff Villanueva open his mouth and say, "Well, how come LeBron doesn't, you know, um, match, you know, the reward money?" Well, hell, why should he? He's a private citizen. He, he, he's still a private just because he's an athlete. He's still a private citizen. Well, he had so much to say about law enforcement. Was he not? Was he telling something untruthful? I mean, he's still a black man just because he's in the upper one percent. You know, and he spoke you know, his, his truth, not only his truth, but the truth of all of us where that we could be subjected to when we, we, we darken his door to go outside, you know, and, and run to a police officer. Mm -hmm. You know, so I just didn't like the, how the shooting of these two sheriffs, as shameful as it happened, it turned political and it's used as a pawn to like uh, to to chop off the movement at his knees, you know, or at least attempt to. And meanwhile, while, while all this is going on here in Compton, there's still no justice for Brianna. They did a settlement, a civil settlement, but those officers still weren't tried. They still, they had Brianna's law that was already passed, you know, before, before baiting the no-knock warrants. But my thing is, okay, when you get on the freeway and you on you drive on the freeway and there's an amber alert, okay, wasn't not uh, the perpetrators who contributed to Amber's um, demise weren't they not captured before an amber alert became a thing? Wasn't Megan's perpetrators not you know um, dealt with the way they should from a criminal justice standpoint before Megan's law became a thing? So how does Brianna's law exist, but yet there's no justice in a way of of uh, holding accountable the four officers who contributed to why Brianna's law is needed in the first place? You know, so that's my take, my question, I should say. You're muted, Reverend Mike. There we go. I was just going to say it sounds like. Um, there's a lack of confidence when uh, young black men are oh, shot yeah. that there's going to be justice of some kind. 
and there's a total trust in the system that uh, people will be brought to justice uh, when law enforcement um, is shot. Not, and that was a pretty heinous, heinous crime, the way it, it almost looked like no uh, like maybe a gang thing where the kid was put initiation. Up yeah. But, um, but still, whatever the reason, you know, it's not, it's not helping the cause, right? So if the cause mm -hmm. is to advance the, uh, um, uh, well, I, I guess for lack of a better word, the political agenda of uh, Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. this doesn't help. Very much so. Right? Because mm -hmm. it just, it plays into that counter narrative that goes out, uh, that plays right into the stereotypes of uh, young black men. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it's just a tragic, it's tragic all the way around. You know, I feel bad for the, the sheriffs. You know, I feel bad for, for a kid who feels like that's something he needs to do. And, uh, and Absolutely. And we know he will eventually be apprehended Mm -hmm. Your point, he, he may he may never again walk free for the rest of his life. Right. For some reason that we don't know of. And um, it's just a these things are tragic all the way around. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been um, reading uh, Res Resma Menekum's book and. And so they're exploring police shootings in there. And a lot of these guys are, you know, uh, Resma's whole thing is that all of this is driven by trauma. Mm -hmm. so the trauma of the, the blue bodies, the trauma of the black bodies, the trauma of the white bodies in ways that we're not even aware of. Uh, and the all the various biases that are involved in that. But, um, and of course, Resma is kind of incredulous with the, with these answers. So the, it's like the gun goes off before they even, for the police, the gun often goes off before they, they're even really aware that they've shot anyone. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, which doesn't excuse it away because they are trained professionals, right? It's, it's mm. not like we're sending out. Uh, you know, Boy Scouts to go do this thing. But uh, it, it's just, it's a very complex, very complex thing. And uh, to the point of uh, Kaepernick, I don't know why this was so hard for people to get, right? To take a knee, to bring attention to, you know, just for, right, for the length of time that it takes to sing the national anthem, right? To honor the country and to honor the flag and also to acknowledge that there's work that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And just remember, hey man, it's it's not the home of the free for everybody. Right. And so it's time to make it right. And so I, I do feel like there's some momentum. Of course, you and I have talked about my concern that you know, we're going to run out of momentum. It's like when I used to run the, believe it or not, in high school, I used to run the high hurdles. Mm -hmm. If you can believe that. Well, yeah, I remember you told me before as I well. Stream. So my claim to fame was I could beat almost anyone to the third hurdle. <laughs> right. But after that, I lost my momentum out of the blocks. Right. You and can't then, call it after that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then it's well, even finished. It was the big wonder. But but that's my concern about this is that we're going to run out. You know, we got a great start. And uh, and there's all this pent up um, demand, if you will. Mm -hmm. And um, and just to to be able to carry that through first first through an election to make sure that uh, people are electing um, representatives that represent their uh, 
their viewpoints on these things. Absolutely. And, um, and then to continue that on through to make sure that we have policies in place that are addressing, um, I really think it's got to be a huge overhaul. I mean, I just know the few things that I've learned, for instance, about uh, black history in just in these last five or six months. Yeah. And all of it is really basic stuff that we've talked about on this program before. But even getting that into the curriculum, you know, starting, I think it's fourth grade, they start getting uh, social studies. That's and, true. You know, just just a little bit so that each year, just like we learn math or anything else that we learn in social studies. Uh, yeah, it builds on itself. Right. So by the time our students get to, let's say, a freshman or sophomore in high school, they, they have a sense of the arc of history, um, of the contribution of, of um, black Americans, but... Uh, uh, but I suppose in that era, uh, the uh, of uh, the post Civil War, where we had uh, a lot of amazing contributions uh, made by um, black uh, inventors, educators. Uh, there was a lot of gains. I mean, there there was a lot of uh, Republican uh, Congress people that were black as well, you yeah. know, in the, the period of reconstruction between 1865 and 1877. And then when you, um, the, speaking of 1877, you probably heard of the, the Great Compromise of 1877 uh, that happened at the Warmly Hotel, you know, in Washington. And there's a, a Jewish fellow named uh, William Levy. Uh, who, remind us of what that is again. The, you know, what the Great Compromise w was basically was, um, in, in a nutshell, that they were, it was transactional. They will roll back federal oversight of the slaves in the South, right? you know, in exchange for, um, I forgot who was the name of the person who opposed uh, Rutherford B. Hayes, but he was going to basically concede the presidency, you know, mm -hmm. to Rutherford B. Hayes because Rutherford B. Hayes was, you know, was in favor of rolling back federal oversight of federal, federal troops that were keeping, make a watch, making sure the slaves remain free. Right. Okay. And then when they rolled back federal oversight, you know, out of the South, um, pretty much that's when the South started, you start seeing these vestiges of uh, statehood take shape and where they let the South uh, do their business, with how they handled the black problem. And that's out of that came the rise of Jim Crow and in 1866, I believe I'm not mistaken, out of Tennessee, that's where the KKK was formed, you know, in response you know, to re Black Reconstruction, because during Black Reconstruction, over 90 Black towns were built from the ground up. And once the KKK was formed, the Black, uh, 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 Black Legion, the Knights of Black Legion or what have you, is the same uh, white supremacist group that murdered Malcolm X's father you know, in, in uh, Omaha, Nebraska. But when these type of groups start popping up, they start burning towns to the ground, like we've discussed in prior weeks before, Tulsa, Rosewood, um, uh, the East St. Louis. You know, a lot of uh, riots, you know, started uh, taking shape in all these uh, black towns. Land was confiscated. Uh, blacks had to flee their homes and, and things like that. So almost um, that's terrorism in itself. And um, when you look at um, how white citizens were deputized, you know, to which was the formation of the police department, I, I might add, hence the term this, like uh, paddy wagon, because they, they, those gentlemen were called paddy rollers, you know, so and paddy wagon, basically. So that's they were slave catchers. And if you look at the early badges you know, of that day. Uh, that's those are the same badges and slight variations or another that you know transition to the badges worn by the police departments. There are eighteen thousand police departments across this, this nation now, and um, you know just a quick pivot to back to Compton. 
um, one thing that wasn't discussed that I think that could be a motivating factor as well is um, just yesterday I read there was a $7 million settlement, you know, by the, uh, the Compton uh, Sheriff's Department, the LA, LA County Sheriff's Department in Compton. And I did some research myself and I saw various uh, acts of some pretty sordid, um, you know, activities that they've been involved in and uh, where you had folks behind the badge who <laughs> were gangs. They, they, were, they had gangs. They call themselves the executioners. You know, so we don't know. This is a conjecture. But given how the dotted lines are formed, it's a valid conclusion. We just don't have anything to support it. I mean, it could be somebody who like, OK, you're the reason why my father's locked away for life. OK, so now I'm coming for you and I, I'm letting off, you know, because I don't care anymore. Because I'm living in death anyway. And living in the ghettos and, and the hood, I mean, you have a lot of people there who have who've lost hope. Who um do, who could care less if they live or die? I mean, I remember uh, no, not only uh, reading about as an adult, but knowing about when we were young, how guys were t look, uh, teenagers telling their mothers what songs they want played at their funeral. You know, I mean, like you talking about science of mind, you know, in the negative. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like it's, that's an absolute value kind of a thing. Like here's zero. Okay, we when you minister you know, and pra and practice science of mind, you do it on the positive side of the number line. Right. Here you are in a state of hopelessness on the negative side of, of the of, of the uh, number line of zero, and you're talking about okay, mom, when I die, you know, play this song in my funeral. I mean, this fella right here, uh, Tupac Amaro Shakur. I can't tell you how many songs he made where um, he said, Mama, don't cry, bury me a G. You know, I mean, and Tupac is, if there's a video, I'm going to share it, um, but there's a video where when Mike Tyson when they first came back from out of prison, he's fought, and he was going through the tunnel, and the hug that he embraced Tupac, he said, Tupac, and they gave each other the strongest a hug. I mean, like, and I said to myself, everybody black, you know, felt that. We felt that. And Tupac has been described by, I don't have his book up, Michael Eric Dyson as the Mike Tyson of hip hop. I mean, because his verse is just uppercut. Bam, bam, bam. And he's coming at you once he, he gets you here. If you, if you think it's gonna, his cadence is going to come out, he just keeps going. And, um, and he spoke our language. You know, like, this guy spoke to our experience in the hood. There's no ac accident why Chuck D of Public Enemy says that hip-hop is the black CNN. You know what I mean? Because it's, that's how we got our, our news, you know, from the street. That's how we knew what was, what was happening. But uh, Tupac, and it was just the 24th anniversary of his passing this earlier this week, and um, he is like, uh, on one hand, he's like Mike Tyson, like Michael Eric Dyson described them, but on the other hand, he's like hip-hop's Marvin Gaye. You know what I mean? Like, he he has ballads where he's like macking to a female trying to, you know, court her, trying to, you know, get her in the bedroom. He has other uh, songs where he's talking about, you know, keep your head up. I mean, one of the main bars in there where he's saying, saying I remember Marvin Gaye used to sing to me, you had a feeling like black was a thing to be. And anybody black, you felt that here. I mean, it gave us like pride, you know, to uh, be, you know, we're forgotten about in the ghetto, but then through um, this unique expression of hip hop and rap and um, poetry on the street. I mean, that's how Biggie was was uh, discovered, you know, freestyling on, on the streets in Brooklyn. You know, so that, give, that gives them visibility and a platform that society at large doesn't give us. You know, but we've been living in a state of death for decades, centuries now, because now we're in the 21st century. 
And I, it's like you, it's like when Muhammad Ali said, okay, you want to throw me in jail? Okay, I've been in jail for 400 years. What's another five? You know, so that's the type of, of mindset when you're dealing with someone with nothing to lose. When you're dealing with someone who's been back up against it, you know, for so damn long, you know, and you see these methods of expression. I mean, like, I could see uh, a Gil Scott Heron if he was a, if he was at his prime in the 90s. And I think he released a few albums, if I'm not mistaken, because he didn't pass away until 2011. You know, but just to think how he was in the early 70s and just to think of his prime was in the 90s. And that's what, you know, Pac was like to us. You know, I mean, like he had songs that talked about um, him and his boy, like, you know, killing police and taking off in a police car. Is it right? Hell no. You know, but he, like he and other hip hop artists, they spoke the language that black people been been talking of in barbershops and beauty salons and on front porches for for generations, and now it's on wax and and available for large consumption mainly by a lot of uh, white patrons. Like I mentioned earlier, a lot of more white folks buy hip hop music than black people. We copy it off of one another. We, we just we just didn't have that kind of um yeah. that kind of bread like that. But you know, the reason why guys are going platinum is because white folks are buying it. White folks are buying NWA and Public Enemy, you know, and, and Tupac Shakur. They, you, um, you know, you mentioned uh, Gil Scott Heron. Mm -hmm. I I was telling you I was watching Lovecraft Country, which is on HBO. Yeah. and it's a uh, horror sci fi, and it's set in the 1950s, and mm -hmm. all the main characters are Black Americans. Yeah. And uh, one of the episodes is called Whitey's on the Moon. I think it's episode two. It might be episode okay. three. Okay. And, uh, you know, the juxtaposition in that song is black people are still fighting for just basic rights, but mm -hmm. whitey's on the moon. White people are, you know, taking this other level. And right. then they juxtapose that with the storyline uh, of, of the show, which is, I take it as the horrors of just being a black person in America in the 1950s. Yeah. And when you, when you have, um, bought into these characters and you love them and you're cheering them on and you see them having to fight for their lives to cross the border of a sundown town before sundown mm -hmm. so that the sheriff doesn't kill them all. Right. And it would have been legal. Um, or you see them just fighting this. It's, it seems so ridiculous to me that anybody would do this to anybody else, but mm -hmm. it was legal. And, and so you know, oftentimes when I'm watching crime dramas, I'm thinking, oh, how are they going to get out of this one? Right, but I right. did get the sense of hopelessness for these characters. He seriously got out of this one. And then in Lovecraft Country, the supernatural element, the, you know, comes in and there's magic and there's monsters and there's all mm -hmm. kinds of other stuff that both it ups the terror, but also has the opportunity to empower them yeah. and so they they find power that helps them you know and and these are stories that were written as books before they became the series so it, i find it educational in so many ways because not only do they have the storyline and the experiences but they have the soundtrack and they have references to mm -hmm. parts of American culture that I didn't know of. So there's a, a podcast, actually, the Lovecraft Country podcast. Okay. And, uh, and primers that you can find online that break it all down for those of us who, you know, this is a lot of this cultural stuff is new to us that I didn't know that Gil Scott Heron song. But now well, I know I who he nice. is and now I'm learning. So that's another way that we can connect to you know fans of media fans of different storytelling genres we put ourselves in the place of these characters that we love if we don't know you know these stories from the people we know we can mm -hmm. get them from characters we see on television absolutely thank you very melena it was a couple of as you were just talking it was a couple of acronyms uh, that mm -hmm. came into my mind that uh, tupac uh, at um, 
coin to get out, put <laughs> out there as well that speak to this. Um, one like you'll hear in, uh, in, in rhymes like they has like so shed so many tears is one song. There's a few other ones I can't think of off the top of my head, but where he talks about I I got that thug life tatted on my chest, and um, thug life is an acronym for the hate you give little infants fucks everybody. And mm-hmm. that's that, that's Tupac, you know, and one of his uh, albums uh, that he had in 1993 is, is, is I mean, he's known if you ask uh, people about the, who, uh, what's the first album that comes to mind when you think about Tupac, they're going to think all eyes on me with California mm-hmm. love. You hear California love blaring out of the speakers at Dodger Stadium with Kimley Jansen coming out to close the, close the game down in the ninth inning. You know, so that's, but that's 25 years after the fact, right? But yeah. for me, one of my favorite albums from him was Strictly For My Niggas. And Niggas was, I'm just saying it, you know, just so you understand the context of what I'm saying it, he has it as an acronym. But he described the acronym in a song called Violent on the album before that, this his, his initial um, LP that he first debuted on. And nigga stood for never ignorant, getting goals accomplished. You know, so mm. this is the way that he spoke to us, you know, and we really, we really got, the, got the message. You know, like he always said, one nigga teach two niggas, teach four niggas, and them niggas teach more niggas. And that's what what his, his deal was. And, mm. um, I think he was on the right track. I mean, not that he, I mean, he could have made some better decisions. Yeah, that, we, we get that. But I never um, uh, hate on what he's meant. I mean, in fact, this fella right here, they're teaching classes about him at Harvard. They're teaching classes about him at Berkeley, you yeah. know, the Ivy League schools. I mean, so this is after his death. Who would have thought that when he was, you know, on you know, talking about ain't nothing but a gangster party, throwing up his dubs, you know, mm-hmm. on an album. Who would have thought that Harvard would be teaching classes about this guy? Who would have thought that Berkeley would be teaching classes about this guy? Mm-hmm. You know, so he's in the in realms of higher education. I mean, so I guess you look that's at, uh, that's some kind of progress too. Yeah, it it, it really is. I mean, because like what what we used to. I mean, now you see, like, well, you have uh, Eminem, who's a very talented, you know, hip hop artist or whatever, you have lyricist, you know, mm-hmm. but now uh, hip hop is being favored by white people. But I remember days where just playing hip hop on the porch would, would cause a police raid. I remember <laughs> and that was in the 80s. Anytime you heard um, uh, like uh, loud bass music coming from somebody's car, they were they're, they're going to get pulled over. You just know it. Anytime it was a house party coming on, the police would come and shut it down. You know, mm-hmm. block parties. They, this block parties are the same. You know, this is just you know how times have have changed. You know, when when um, before you know LL Cool J. You know, became on the was it on the NCS NCIS L A NCIS L A before he was that you know, he was he had his radio and mm-hmm. he was playing I'm bad you know mm-hmm. you know what I mean and so like he had his Kango he was rocking his Kango mm-hmm. I mean you have Ice T selling like extended warranty plans for cars you know during the morning time on commercial slots you know what I mean <laughs> but look at his pathway he was on uh. Uh, law and order, but he, he mm-hmm. once upon a time sang cop killer. Mm-hmm. He was once upon a time saying original gangster. He was once upon a time singing I, I'm Your Pusher, where he sampled from Cur- Curtis Mayfield. You know, so you look at like where people start and where they end up. I mean, you know, you tell the story. I mean, Ice Cube is, a, is another one. I mean, he started out, you know, you know um, straight out of Compton to fuck the police, this, that, and the other. You know, kill at will, death certificates. I mean, and I remember every single album that he's had, and we've and we've recited. We know all the lyrics, you know. <laughs> but he transitions from that to, "Are we there yet?" Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So now you're at a point where you're palatable, palatable to mainstream uh, society. But I still, this is what their what their palatability to mainstream society is what they're known for today. But mm-hmm. I remember the foothold that they had for our culture and for our plight, you know, in the in the hood and how we right. grew up. That's what how we remember them. 
them, you know. Was was Ice Cube's first film uh, in Boys in the Hood? Because that's mm-hmm. the first time I remember seeing him. Absolutely. And uh, okay. the late John Singleton directed uh, Boys mm-hmm. in the Hood. I mean, and uh, when you look at the early 90s and you look at the genre of movies at that time, so mm-hmm. you're talking... Okay, first in 1990, you had Mo Better Blues. You had Spike Lee, right? And um, But for a year before that, you had Glory. Denzel Washington makes his um, debut on the big screen, but a lot of people don't remember Denzel was on St. Elsewhere, you know, in the right. early 80s. You know, yeah. but, um, <laughs> but going forward from 90, look at 1991, New Jack City. Who's in that? Ice-T, who we just mentioned. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, then you had, um, what's his name? Uh, Nelson, uh, what's his first name? Drud Nelson, Judd Nelson, Judd Nelson. That's his name. And then, mm. you, but you had on the opposite end, the opposite of Ice, you had Wesley Snipes, and right. Wesley Snipes was on the Michael Jackson's Bad video, and people don't remember that, you right. know. But then, as time went on, he was on Money Train, and then now uh, he became um, he becomes somewhat palatable in, in a sense where he's acceptable, but we still remember Wesley Snipes, right? Mm-hmm. But you look at when uh, 91, New Jack City and Boys in the Hood come out in succession. Right. And so when well, you got to think, what are they trying to do here? Okay. Then you took, go to 1992. Uh, have you heard of the movie Juice? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the Tupac's film uh, debut. Okay. You know, he played Bishop. And um, Bishop, he was just this crazed guy that once he like killed one dude, that he was just going on on a war path to the point where it deteriorated the relationship that he had with his homies. And um, you know, but Tupac didn't really have to take acting classes to be Bishop. If you watch the movie, you see and know how Tupac lived. Tupac was Bishop in real life, so you know. But but that's ninety two, right? And I remember coming up in Chicago that there were shootings at all at the theaters where all these movies dropped. Then 1993 comes around, what hits the scene? Menace to Society. And I mentioned that, I think, on one of our earlier talks. Um, yeah. yeah, Lorenz Tate, there's a fella named Tyron Turner who played on as a young kid on Michael Jordan's uh, uh, Come Fly With Me video. You know, so you had uh, uh, Charles S. Dutton who played rock. He was on a TV show, Rock, who was the garbage man. You know, so mm-hmm. yeah, all these um, films in rapid succession that so come these are out the, that, the hood classics? The, the hood classics, yeah. <laughs> so they're, they're painting it, what it, does, what it is, is painting an image. So you had 91, 92, 93, then you had the crime bill in 94, and then in 95, you had dead presidents. You see, mm-hmm. so and so let's talk about jobless Vietnam vet that has him and his, his homie had to resort to crime, you know, in order to make ends meet. You know, now he comes back and he doesn't have a job. He doesn't. His girl was um, was creeping with with a neighborhood drug dealer kingpin or something. Mm-hmm. So now he's in disillusionment and he's trying to like go for a come up, and it ultimately costs him life in prison. You know, mm-hmm. so then you had in '96, I mean, you have uh, gang related. Mm-hmm. And um, that was one of the last films that Pac you know, uh, acted in. It was released in 97, but it was shot in 96. But then, of course, he passed in 96, right? Mm-hmm. You know, so when you look at the uh, how coincidental the, uh, and uh, chronologically placed these movies are, and then you look at what's sandwiched in between, like I mentioned, 94, the, the crime bill, okay? <laughs> and then you have uh, the bookends of, of Hood Classics right after that. You have Belly is in there. You know, so you have like, there's so many more that I can't even mention, but I look at that as by design, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And it puts, it, it has, even though it's telling our story, it's a double-edged sword where it's framing a narrative that, okay, I gotta be sure when I see the, I don't know this guy. Is he six foot seven? He looked like he's from Chicago or something, but I'm going over here. I ain't messing with him. You know, so he looked like he might try and like, um, like, um, like uh, rob me or rape me or something like that. So I'm going over here. You know what I mean? So it, yeah, so it created the this negative mm-hmm. stereotype. Absolutely. And, and that's been the one of the one of America's uh, chief exports, if you will, you know, because there are mm-hmm. foreigners who've come over from the subcontinent of India, some of whom I've worked with, and they'll say, uh, man, Solana, you're a really cool guy. I tell you, like, they didn't talk about uh, 
I didn't get this experience from my people back, you know, in New Delhi or in Bombay or something like that. So, like, this is all new. You know what I mean? Like, they told us before they set for sale over here to, hey, watch out for the black dudes over there. Because they, they know the six of us on the six o'clock news is being pervaded over there. You know, and so it's like the saying that a lie makes its way around the world while truth is getting out of bed, getting his shoes on. That's pretty much what we have. Yeah. So, uh, in this, oh, go ahead, Rev. I just want to ask a question just to play devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. so, um, does the community bear any responsibility in the way these stories were presented? So I'm a little older than you. In my era, uh, mm -hmm. Fly was the big yeah and they had this time where they had the black Curtis Mayfield. yeah and, and they called them black exploitation films right? absolutely yes uh, so that but they correct me if I'm wrong I, I think mm -hmm. that, uh, uh, black writers maybe not producers but writers anyway sure uh, yeah so I mean it's part of the story and yes draw you know there's a the dramatic part of it mm -hmm. as far as uh, I'm also thinking about MTV and some yes. of the trails. Uh, uh, anyway, it, uh, let's just say it doesn't portray young black American men as uh, virtuous young men. <laughs> looking Very for, true. Looking for the right girl to settle down and have a family with. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and that's part of um, the overhaul of Hollywood is telling mm -hmm. stories that that don't normally get told because the sensationalism is what sells, and so that's what right. what gets you know well, becomes the product. The fear component, right? So the, that's right, right? So uh, uh, Resma Menachem talks about. Mm -hmm. the fear that white bodies have of black bodies and also that uh, black bodies, a belief that black bodies are impervious to pain. Mm -hmm. Now uh, he puts that and, in the And that's a generation's old love uh, perception too. Right. But, yeah. but then I also got to thinking about how uh, sports plays into that because so many of our sports heroes are black, uh, particularly on on. Now I don't. You know basketball because you're a basketball. Absolutely. Player. But you know, in football, uh, you're always playing hurt. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, you're seeing these collisions, and everybody's going, "Oh yeah, good hit," and blah. I do the same thing, and and yet it hurts. And yet, you don't get that watching it on TV. You don't get it unless you've actually played the game. That's right. And um, and I presume. I don't know about today's basketball, but certainly in the Showtime era with the Detroit teams. <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. You, you just brought a sore no, spot for a bull stand. Like I mean, <laughs> right. I mean, that was, it, they were physical games, right? But what I'm getting yes. at is people don't relate pain to what the athletes are going through. I, so I'm just kind of wondering if how all this plays into this narrative this cultural narrative that we have um, that not only uh, desensitized has desensitized us to violence, mm -hmm. um, but also desensitized us to, uh, to pain itself. And I don't know the answer to that, uh, except that it seems to me that in order to get to lasting change, we're going to have to acknowledge really the hurt that's behind all this stuff without question and then you also have the dysfunctionality like when uh, when i say um when i say that i'm specifically talking about uh sexual recklessness that's played out on wax i mean um you have um cardi b there's a song that's uh viral out that's called uh, the acronym is wap it's wap but um 
I'll tell you that's not suitable for viewers what it stands for. You know what I'm talking about, right, Melina? So um, yes, please uh, Google that yeah. on your own time and make, exactly. You know, so the, incognito mode or something. I say I'm actually clueless on this. Okay, one. okay. You just okay. Say, so stop by. Window. Stop by Lowe's and grab yourself a gutter while you're at it. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you know. But you have this uh, sexual recklessness that has played itself out, you know, as well. Um, mm -hmm. There's so many uh, artists um, that have gone down this rabbit hole. Uh, I think of one, uh, the fellow from Oakland, uh, Too Short. And um, mm -hmm. I met him when I was a senior in high school, uh, mm -hmm. when I was on a college visit at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska. And mm -hmm. uh, that's like early February 94. I took the, got on the bus that weekend. And he happened to have a record signing right around the corner from the campus. And you should have seen the line of white people that was out here. I'm like, damn, y'all know about Too Short? Y'all know about <laughs> Short Dog in the house? You, you know, blow the whistle? You know, the, I mean, I started, I mean, they were rapping the songs. They were, I mean, they knew it all. And so I, I knew what it was, but I met him. He's a nice fella. You know, but there's an interview that he did where, um, he talked about some, it was some record executives. I forget the name escapes me. I think they were the heads of uh, Jive Records at the time, or who he was under. And uh, basically they told him, uh, we want you, we don't want none of that conscious stuff. Because uh, in 1990, he dropped a song called The Ghetto. And uh, if you listen to the tune, it was sampled from Donny Hathaway, a mm -hmm. song with the same title, The Ghetto, the same mm -hmm. bass line and everything. And but he, the, when you listen to the words that he's rapping, is rapping a, a message, you know. And um, <clears throat> like, what do you say? Like, uh, the story I tell is so incomplete. Five kids in the house, no food to eat. Don't look at me and don't ask me why. Mama's next door, getting high, you know. So these are like, let's just let's, let's, let's all a little snippet. But the whole song had a message to it. But he said that record executives had had a meeting with him. And they said, we want you to come out with the most nastiest, you know, most like sexified, whatever, for lack of a better paraphrasing, uh, album that Too Short can come up with. And Because they knew Too it Short, would sell. They knew it would sell. Ex exactly right. So, and here you have, there's a reason why, um, you know, at once upon a time, two live crew, uh, Luke, Luke Skywalker out of Miami, you know, mm. I remember when, he they censored his albums they sent it sent it to live crew you know mm -hmm. I mean, they were the precursor to all this and but then after that they said well, hey this sells we can uh really like move the imagery and the perception here so yeah. why don't we and, and these guys and and ladies like cardi and so forth when they when they get that deal, they're gonna take it. I mean, you got people that grown up with um, uh, I called it the eating wish sandwiches, where you had two pieces of white pieces of Wonder Bread, and you wish you had something in the middle, you know, or thought burgers. Okay, so you have Beyond Burgers now. Okay, it was beyond your imagination, you know, what you could eat you know, today, you know, yeah. but you know, like at that time, we had with sandwiches and thought burgers. So you had people that grew up like we all grew up and they offer you a bag to just to like drop bars, on all kinds of dumb shit that you can think of where you got to take off, um, take off your, your halter top or uh, have your underwear or like, flying that half mask you know, for the camera, this is what you're going to do, you know, it, it, but in exchange for the bag. And, and mm -hmm. that's just, that's pretty much where we are. So yeah, there is some culpability, uh, individual culpability on the decisions that you, that you make there. I do agree with that. Mm -hmm. However, I do understand the overarching, um, you know, fishbowl, you know, the mm -hmm. ecosystem and wish that culpability was your know, issue. You know what I'm saying? So if you have this uh, ecosystem that is dysfunctional and it gives way to death, at, uh, death style at every turn, yeah, I can understand how, okay, um, this person who grew up in a single parent home who didn't have a guidance or who uh, was uh, molested when they were younger, you can see how that could um, transition and create these types of tragic outcomes. Yeah. Uh, and that's 
you know, and we have cr the crack cocaine epidemic that really Bingo. freeway Ricky re really hammered yeah. the uh, black community. Mm -hmm. and I remember when crack cocaine hit the hood. Yeah, I remember. I mean, like we used to hang out as little kids just on the porches and, and hang out like, you know, we used to go in each other's houses and get fixed sandwiches and stuff like that. But then we used to start seeing the rumors going around. I said, oh, so-and-so strung out. Or uh, so and so was like, um, he, like, he like doing a little something like, or looking at you kind of funny, you know what I mean? And so mm -hmm. then, like, your, my mom was like, no, she wasn't having that. So she said, as soon as one street light come on, you was on this side of the street where I can watch you, you know. But it's so many um, uh, things that have transpired with crack cocaine hitting the hood. And next thing you know, when you have guys that you grew up with, because our circle of friends, I, we still cool with them. I mean, they're, they're nice people and stuff, but when they, as you grow up and you start seeing, well, oh damn, he GD now? He gangster disciple now? Oh damn, oh, oh you, you Blackstone now? Okay, oh damn. And so you start looking around and it's only like seven or eight of us left. We're like, all right. This is what it is, Dan. This is what we're going to have to do to survive. But the, even the guys that I knew that succumbed to the streets, you know, they were still like, we had like, um, how can I say, espionage, if you will, into the street organizations where we had our ear to the streets where they would say, okay, um, such and such is about to go down. So you don't be here at, at such and such a time. And we made sure we weren't there. Sure enough, it was an ambush. You know, somebody getting killed. You know, you know, six thousand dollars in the car, bad drug deal. You know, that's pretty much what happens. Yeah, but um, so we used that. Look, I mentioned a few weeks ago that uh, fluidity that I had. So we kind of mastered that fluidity as far as moving about, where not too many people knew who we were because we flew under the radar. But I had. Uh, a file cabinet in my mind, like oh, so who was who? I said, okay, I know this dude from on 51st Street. I know what he into. He got a rap sheet doing this day. I had everything mapped out where I knew exactly who I was talking to, knew exactly who was walking past me, knew what not to be, where not to be at a certain time. So mm -hmm. you had it kind of figured out. And that's the kind of survival techniques that kick in when you live in that kind of environment. And you know, to a lot of people who uh, who can't move about or don't have that intellectual gift to uh, kind of maneuver that way, then they succumb to it as to the point where, okay, fuck it, I'm getting high anyway. Okay, I'm strung out anyway. My mama is uh, turning tricks anyway. You know, so what the hell do I got to go to school right. for? You know right. what I mean? So what for? You know, so it's, it, mm -hmm. I understand like how a death style could just take a hold and literally like strangle the life out of uh, people's willpower, you know? Yeah, the hopelessness of it all. Mm -hmm. And of course, the black community is not the only one susceptible. Absolutely. That's that, that right there. Nothing but a word you just said. Yeah, yeah. it's, uh, and you're right. Once you're, once you get into that mindset, you really have to work diligently but you know when we talk about resources needed for a community mm -hmm. right that's exactly you know resources isn't just throwing money at it but it's it's throwing people who are trained and committed to helping people out of that mindset mm -hmm. so that they can pull out of that hopelessness absolutely which, which our teaching of course is what we are attempting to do um, by um, incorporating the idea that there is a component to our spiritual life where uh, thought is not only encouraged and invited, mm -hmm. uh, but that we recognize that we're open to some kind of divine guidance and an infinite power and presence that can help move us off to our current condition, regardless how how, how hopeless it is. Absolutely. You know, I, I didn't have to deal with that, but, you know, <clears throat> I was thirsty there for a few years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so so I can relate to all of what you just said. And uh, uh, and uh, just uh, for folks who are struggling uh, 
with these addiction issues in, in whatever mm -hmm. form and from of whatever stripe, you know, it's just, um, um, well, there's just a lot of work to be done there. And that's, that's why I have an eternal love for the nation of Islam because, um, you know, I can never seen, you know, an entity that can go in, in, in there and basically like, uh, love you through all your bullshit. I mean, I've seen them interact with people who are just on some shit and, and uh, you know, just like, I mean, just wilding, you know, like, oh man, you know, but they like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. You know, the, I mean, they're, they're so uh, humble. I mean, mm -hmm. and I mean, like, I, I mean, you credit uh, Honorable Elijah Lime, you credit Mr. Farrakhan for putting these, these uh, men and, and women on the streets and selling their paper, uh, building a school. It's like, I mean, they, they're the ones who are creating gang truces. It's not even the church. It's not even the, the cops. Even in Los Angeles, um, I know, um, I forget the police chief's name here, but he and uh, Mr. Tony Muhammad, you know, of the Nation of Islam here, like, they're relying on them to the break of the truces to keep the truces intact, you know, in the hood. With the so, if you got the rolling sixties going at it like with the mob pie rules, you know, they coming down there to like, okay, let's get to the table and let's solve the issue. When um, Suge Knight was at his height, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, you had the East Coast West Coast um, a beef that cost us Tupac and Biggie within a matter of five months. You know, okay, so then you have, um, you know, Puffy, well, P. Diddy now, as he's known, and it should go in at it because they were executives from Bad Boy and Death Row, and so all their artists and things like that, and Suge was collecting uh, tax money from any out-of-town artist who was coming to Los Angeles to perform, and they didn't perform. His henchman was coming to see him. Who put a, who, like, pretty much put a halt to all that? Mr. Farrakhan had uh, all these uh, folks, all these uh, hip hop artists in his home and did a gang cruise right there, you mm -hmm. know, and it's just um, amazing uh, to me. And I think that um, any support that they can be given to the nation of Islam, the, that's, 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 they have the blueprint already. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel, but mm -hmm. I think they're the, the, the folks who can do it. Cause they like anytime where, it was crime in the Chicago projects mm -hmm. and um, the nation of Islam brokered a deal with the city of Chicago when I was still living there in 94 to um, provide security. Crime took a nosedive and mm -hmm. they don't even carry weapons. The F fruit of Islam, the FOI, they don't even carry weapons because they had a respectability factor. So when mm -hmm. I see like how the fruit of Islam took crime uh, down uh, sharply, and a Robert Taylor Homes and the Ida B. Wells of Chicago, um, there's your model for community policing right there. There's your model for how you create a, um, a uh, kindred partnership between your community and your community police force. You know what I mean? But, Where, but the Nation of Islam also trains people to mm -hmm. do those roles, right? You, Absolutely. You, you get some uh, teachings, you get some understanding you're not just putting random volunteers out on the street where they're facing challenging situations there's support there's a whole structure a support system uh, and that's absolutely. why it's successful and, and other people like i know late michael jackson he's um hired foi around uh, uh, around him for security and mm -hmm. uh, they provided uh, security for you know for larger um more mixed events that are more mainstream they provide a security for, you know, you've seen them at uh, Aretha's funeral, you've seen them, you know, at George Floyd's memorial, they were flanked, you know, and they, they just know how to do, to get business done. Wow. Well, we're coming up on an hour here. So, or actually we passed it. So let us have some closing thoughts for anybody who's still with us watching. Uh, Rev, you, you want to tie yeah, I think I kind of just you going did back it. to what I was <laughs> just going back to what I was saying earlier about um, uh, you know we there is definitely a role for faith communities mm -hmm. to step into these spaces to help try to uh, bridge 
uh, the gap between um, these um, these groups that just aren't good at talking to each other unless there's a third yeah. party there. Right. But it's doable. Mm -hmm. So I would say uh, the Nation of Islam has forged a path mm -hmm. uh, that can, um, and they have the credibility within the community, excuse me, within the community. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the homeboys, uh, Father Boyle, he's another mm -hmm. one working with the, uh, uh, his Hispanics, so so they're out there. Yeah, we just need to support them and and find ways to, um, well, just find ways to do more than you know. Give them that out of right. Boy. Yeah. Yeah. Right, or assume they've got it covered because there are two people doing it in all of you know the United States, and just go, yeah, oh absolutely. yeah, they've got it. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> You have 330 million people, yeah, right. but to those two, they got it. Yeah, they got it. <laughs> YouTube. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. All right. Well, thank you, Salam. Thank you, Reverend Mike. Thank you. Thank welcome. you for all of those watching. Sure. And, uh, you know, for, for our viewers and listeners, tune in uh, next time. See what's happening. Visit the YouTube channel for CSL Granada Hills. Uh, check out the website for cslgh.org and, um, you know, come and see what's what's going on and join us in our conversations that we have on Sundays and hear and, Reverend Mike's talks. If, you wanna, if you're watching it, well, you won't be watching us, but we also mm -hmm. have meditation on uh, Wednesday nights. Mm -hmm. So if you happen to be watching this on a Wednesday before seven o'clock, you can join us for a little healing meditation time, too. You know what? And if, if anybody watching knows a police officer, please invite them to watch the Wednesday meditation because the more police officers we can support in getting time of peace and centering, uh, the better off our communities will be. So there's, there's one way that our community can reach out to our local police and just invite them in to learn yeah. about being peaceful. Yeah, the good ones aren't our adversaries at all. We'd like to partner with them. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And all help right. maybe the ones that aren't so good to be good, <laughs> to yeah, be more reform. mindful, to be more right. uh, soften you know, up. Yeah. Soften all right. So stay safe. Thanks, everybody. Bye Thank for you. now. Bye, Zan.